Welcome to the Expat Empire Podcast, the podcast where you can hear from expats around the world and learn how you can join them. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today on the Expat Empire Podcast. Before we get to the interview, I want to remind you that we're offering a free consulting call to anyone interested in moving abroad. Whether you're thinking about retiring somewhere warm, starting an international career, or becoming a digital nomad, we're ready to help you think through the next steps in your journey. Send us a message at expatempire.com to schedule your call today. With that said, let's start the conversation. Hey, Thomas. Thanks so much for joining us today in the Expat Empire podcast. Yeah, man. Good to be here. Awesome. Well, it'd be great if you start out by telling us a little bit about where you're from, where you've lived around the world so far, and where you're living right now. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, where to start? Uh, I'm originally from South Texas, Corpus Christi, Texas. Um, let's see. I grew up there. I went to university and stuff, mostly in Texas. My entire life was just lived there in the U.S. Um, then after I finished my bachelor's degree, I got offered a kind of scholarship program in South Korea. Uh, so I went there, moved there, and uh, did my master's there for two years, then worked for a bit, and then left. Uh, moved to Romania, which I'm sure we'll get into the details of all that. Um, and then afterwards, moved back to the US, but now I'm living in the Czech Republic in Prague at the moment. Awesome. Yeah, definitely excited to get through all the different parts of your journey. But I'd love if we could just start a bit about where you got your in initial interest in living abroad, because I know that we both had originally quite an interest in Japan and it led us to, you know, practice some Japanese together, be able to take a trip together during our university years. That's where we met each other. So I'd love to know where that interest in maybe Japan or just living abroad came from and how that developed for you over the years. Yeah, for sure. I like how you say practice Japanese together when reality well, we did a little bit. <laughs> way better than I was. <laughs> but um, yeah, so let's see. I mean, I guess growing up, I was I was really into anime, man, and and video games and stuff. And so I was like, I had this this huge like love for everything Japan growing up. And um, oddly enough, though, that didn't really that wasn't really a factor in me moving uh, away. It was kind of just more coincidental, actually. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess that kind of first sparked my interest in foreign languages and whatnot, even though, you know, I, I tried learning some Japanese, like we said, but I mean, really, I'm, I'm of the mind that you, you can't really learn a language very well unless you actually like live in a place and you're using it every day. And, right. you know, just like this whole thing about like, oh, well, I'm just going to go and use, uh, what is it like Rosetta Stone, you know, three hours a day and like, it's not going to happen. But um, regardless, yeah. Uh, yeah, so there was that kind of interest, but really what got me uh, to move away was actually, well, this may sound weird, but I used to be really religious growing up. Uh, and I mean, I'm not mm. anymore. But uh, at the time, when I was offered this, you know, this kind of scholarship thing, there was like this part of me that actually thought that like, I could hear God talking to me. And I thought that he actually like wanted me to move there. Mm. So that kind of was mm. the first impetus to go. I mean, it, it wasn't anything cultural. It was just mm. more of like a, well, I gotta, because that's what God says. <laughs> so, yeah. Right, right. Because I, I remember thinking back on that time that you were also thinking about potential other opportunities following university graduation, potentially staying around Austin, Texas, where we went to school. That's right. So I'm curious how it ended up developing into, of course, how did you actually initially get this opportunity to go to Korea in that case? And how did you make the decision that that was the spot? I mean, what was sort of your decision making process? And ultimately, I guess, feeling God's call as you felt it at the time? Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, the the way that it all kind of happened was super coincidental, which probably also further contributed to my feeling that it was mm -hmm. like, oh, well, it must be a sign, you know, but um, I mean, it was weird. I, I was getting close to, to graduating university and needed a job. And I um, went to, I, I just got some random email from the, the career finder services people uh, in the university, mm -hmm. the ones that help you find a job after you graduate. And they just said, hey, you know, there's this uh, scholarship program from this one, you know, company. Uh, if you're interested, sign up. 
and I, I wasn't, <laughs> but I just thought, nah, but yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I need to, I need to submit my resume to a lot of places. <laughs> What's the harm? And so I did. And they were like, Hey, these people want to meet you for an informal interview. And I was like, man, I got to rush between my classes. I don't want to do this, but <laughs> fine, I guess. So I met this guy and I was like sweaty because it was, you know, like in the middle of like, it was like late spring, almost early summer, right. Austin, Texas, walking around outside. And I met this guy like, and I was huffing and puffing and 10 minutes, 15 minutes, we talked and I walked away thinking, all right, I mean, that nothing's going to come from this. And then, boom, right. hey, they're interested in, you know, for you to come to California and do some interview. I thought, oh man. So anyway, this whole thing happened and eventually they were like, hey, they want you to move to Korea. And I was like, oh, no, I don't. Now I actually have to make a decision. Like, and it was, it, it was weird because, okay, yeah, like we said, I was really religious at the time. And I thought that I was going to, I had it in my mind that I was going to stay in Austin and like me and some Christian friends were going to um, live in this house and like take care of homeless people. Um you know, and that's all well and good mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, but <laughs> one of the things that really swayed me was my parents. They were mm. like, you know, everybody who's graduating university is probably going to stay in Austin. So it's going to be really hard for you to find a job. You should take this Korea deal. And I was like, no, no way. But eventually, long story short, I ended up somehow thinking, yeah, God wants me to go there. <laughs> so, so I did. And right. uh, yeah. Yeah, makes sense. So in terms of then that experience, what was it like to transition your life to South Korea? Was it even, did, had you visited the country before or was this all brand new for you very, for the very first time? completely, completely brand new. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's see. Well, yeah, you and I, we took a trip, you know, to Japan uh, before, you know, a couple of years prior. And I mean, I guess mm -hmm. I could probably say that Japanese culture and Korean culture share a lot of similar touchstones let's say i mean it would make sense right. right i mean there was a lot of colonization at the hands of japan to korea for a long time blah 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 but ultimately i mean when i when i moved there it was just it, it was a big adjustment what can i say it was uh it was kind of weird i guess like before i moved abroad i got this feeling like well of course there are different cultures but that just means that like the food's different and, you know, they, people right. maybe like over there, they bow instead of shake hands. I can get used to that. That's no problem. But there are so many other like just subtle facets of life that I n never took into account before. You know, there's like one of the things is, you know, the way that we, we white people do conversation. It's, you know, it's pretty common, like in the US, you know, <laughs> you say something or you like you ask a question and the other person responds and then they ask you a question. It's like, it's kind of like tennis back and forth. In Korea, none of that. You know, you ask somebody, there were times I like ask somebody a question and they would just be like, hmm, yeah, I don't know about that. And I was just like, <laughs> okay, cool. So what do you think about that? And they would just be like, was this, uh, was this somebody that you already knew or this was a new person that you were just meeting for the first time? Yeah, that that's also, yeah. Funny. You should mention that. Right. Um, mm. I think this was like, maybe after I'd moved there, I'd been there about two weeks and, uh, one of my lab mates, you know, in the, the lab I was working at, at the university was there. So, I mean, yeah, I, I'm sure by his standards, I was pretty much a stranger. <laughs> and so, yeah, he, he probably had less reason to to be friendly or mm. open or forthcoming with me but right i guess for right. me in my in my american overly friendly mind i i was like he obviously just doesn't like me and then the next person i was like they don't like me either yeah and you know everybody i met i was like nobody likes me why doesn't anybody <laughs> want to talk to me or be my friend you know so right that was one of the big things right so how did you actually make that group of friends that you hung out with in Korea? Were they mostly other expats or other students? Were they co uh, co-workers or colleagues at the lab? Uh, where did you have a lot of local friends, Korean friends? How did that work for you? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think when it first started, I, I was really elitist in a sense. Like I saw a lot of, I saw a lot of other expats that were there and they only hung out with expats. Mm. And I was like, man, what's wrong with you? Like, why did you bother traveling? You know, if you're just going to like hang out with people that are similar to you, that's, you're kind of missing the point, right? You travel to foreign places. So you get to know foreign people and learn foreign things. And after living there for about 
six or eight months, <laughs> I, I understood why. Like it was, yep. it was tough, man. It was, it was really isolating. And, you know, like I, I tried to make friends with Korean people and I just like, it never really clicked. I think like just the cultural differences were just so huge. And it was weird because I felt like a lot of other foreigners I knew there felt the exact same thing. Like, you know how if you mm-hmm. see somebody like walking a dog go by and like there's somebody else that's like talk, walking a dog, then they go by. And like normally, you know, the dog is just sort of like, no, nah, whatever. And like, yeah, there's humans around, but they don't really. But as soon as they spot another dog, they're like and they start, you know, like, interacting and like going over. And, like, right. That's exactly like <laughs> foreigners in Korea. Like we would just I, it was weird. You would go to like the foreigner part of town. Itaewon was the name of it. And you could just like sit in a coffee shop and watch outside and you'd see like some, some white person walk across and then there'd be somebody else that comes along and they would just be like, uh, complete strangers. And out of nowhere, they'd just be like, Oh, Whoa, you're, you're like me. Let's, let's be friends. And it was, <laughs> it was weird, you know, like, they didn't know anybody and they were just like, it's so desperate for connection that, you know, right. that they were just willing to do that. Did you find it difficult to communicate on a day-to-day basis in Korea? And did you learn much Korean or, or did you did you make that a priority for you during your time there? I did, yeah. Um, I, I did make like a lot of efforts to learn Korean. Um, let's see, like I first like took a couple of classes and um, then I started doing language exchanges, language exchanges with people, which is like surprisingly super common in Korea because there's also mm-hmm. a lot of Koreans who want to learn English. Um, but yeah, I think ultimately, I mean, despite my efforts and stuff, uh, listening in foreign languages has always been my weak point. And so I would maybe be able to mm. like express some basic sentence, but when they would respond to me, I would just, you know, be petrified. Um, right. Right. so as a result, like most of my conversations with people did take place in English. And I found, though, that the majority of people in mm-hmm. Korea, like, they have a, a really good command of the English language. I mean, they're, I think yeah. they, they're kind of taught from a young age that, like, if you want to be successful, you need to have every advantage you can. And if you want to make it in the business world, English, you got to do it. So communicating in English wasn't so much of a problem. Uh, I don't really think it was even like a language barrier issue. I think it was more of like a cultural, cultural mm-hmm. barrier, if you want to call it that. Sure, sure. So what was it like for you to actually study in Korea? How would you compare that to the experience of studying in the United States? Yeah, um, studying in Korea was, it was quite different, I have to admit. Um, I mean, granted, when I was going to university in Texas, you would oftentimes get professors that were obviously there because they were brilliant researchers pushing humanity forward in science and whatever. But they just also had to teach and they didn't want to be there. Like they just Mm. would just phone it in every single class or they would just like mumble at the chalkboard and you would get that every now and again. It was also the case in Korea. You would get that a lot. But also on top of that, there is, I think like in in Korean culture, there's, there's a very strong sense of hierarchy. And as soon as you meet someone, even like, you know, it's really normal. You meet someone like, hi, what's your name? My name is so-and-so cool, how old are you? And it's right. just, just what you do. Because <laughs> yeah. as soon as you meet someone, you got to find out where you are in relation to them and whether you should use polite form with them or you can use familiar form or what suffix you should attach to their name, all that stuff. And so as a result, this hierarchy thing in the classroom is also really important. And guess what? If you're a student, you're below and the teacher is above. And so if you don't understand it, tough luck, man. Like you're just too stupid. Like obviously the, the teacher's doing their job and it, it is not right. your call to tell them to repeat themselves or to clarify. You just, you just got to do it. And I think that was one of the big things. Um, there was mm-hmm. also kind of a feeling too, that there was, there was a lot more feeling of like just rote memorization. It was, there, there wasn't so much this thing of like, here are the concepts, this is how the concepts bind together underneath, so you can come up with new ideas for yourself, or you can critically think about the pieces. It was just like, mm-hmm. here are the facts, learn them. And the test is just going to be about the facts. And as a result, that was also a bit disappointing for me, because I, I don't know, I mean, mm-hmm. I just felt weird going to a test. And yeah, sure, I'd pass it. But yeah. afterwards, I'd be like, I don't know 
how to do any of this, <laughs> you know? So, right. Yeah. And before this, before this program, did you actually think that you would go back for a master's degree or was that just out of the pure opportunity that this program provided you? It was purely to get a job, man. <laughs> it was, yeah. I mean, I, I had no really interest or plan to get a master's degree, mm-hmm. but it was just, these people were offering me to, yeah, I was going to get a master's degree and then work afterwards. And so uh, I was like, well, this is my path to a job. And if I get a master's degree along the way, cool. Why not? Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about how the job was. So how, how was it going from graduating with your then master's degree into the Korean workforce? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, it was interesting to me to see how in a way, like, man, I feel like I'm, I'm really trashing Korea here. So I'm going to try, I'm going to try to say some positives, <laughs> but in case dear listener, you didn't get this feeling already. I didn't really have a great time in Korea. So, right, right. Uh, but I'm just trying to be honest here. Uh, yeah, so you please can get do. the most information you can, if you want to move there. Um, yeah. So one positive thing I'd say is that I did feel like in the workforce, it was kind of expected that you would be friends with your coworkers. So there was a lot of just after work, like we're going to this restaurant and we're going to get really drunk together. And that would happen often. And so as a result, it was meant to like, you know, kind of make you closer with your, your coworkers and whatever, but this would often happen, you know, like multiple times weekly. And it was also enforced Mm. in a way it wasn't company policy, right. but it's, right. if you don't do it, yeah. yeah. Did did you also experience something similar when you were in Japan? Yeah, yeah. Japan's totally the same on that. I mean, I didn't have too many of those experiences at the company that I was working at the time, but this notion of yeah, uh, the mandatory voluntary company parties is <laughs> definitely a big voluntary. topic in Japan as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So it's not like you get fired, but you know, people are going to think you're weird and you'll definitely be an outsider if you don't go to these. So, uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was kind of tough, honestly, for me, because I would, I would usually show up and it, it was just like, it was just awkward. You know, we'd gradually get drunker and, you know, as we would get more drunk, like the walls would kind of come down and you would sort of be able to talk with people. But yeah, it, it still, especially the fact that it was kind of made mandatory, I usually just did my best to avoid them. If I could. <laughs> um, mm, yeah, so mm. that, that was unfortunate. Um, another part about working in Korea is that th- there's sort of this unspoken thing, at least when I worked there. Um, one thing that's really interesting about Korea is that they're, they're changing really rapidly as a culture. Um, so who knows? It may be completely different now, but I mean, I was living there, you know, years ago, like 10 years ago. Um, yeah, one of the one of the things was that it was kind of expected that if you're working, you don't leave before your boss leaves. And so as a result, mm. you know, if the boss is like just hanging out, even if he's just there at work, like looking at Facebook or whatever, you know, late because he just doesn't feel like going home, you got to stay there and you got to look busy. And right. I right. I was not a fan of that. You know, it, it was more about the appearance mm. of look, being a hard worker rather than, well, are you actually getting things done? Are you actually, you know, are you actually doing something that's useful here? So um, that was right, that was also something right. that didn't really jive with me too well, honestly. Yeah. So were you on a team completely otherwise filled with Korean people, or was it a really sort of foreign friendly environment? Um, so on my team, there was actually this other guy from Russia. Um, and he and I actually became really good friends. Uh, he introduced me to his other Russian friends and we all kind of like formed this little group hanging out, you know? Yeah. Like post cold war, you know, group hanging out time. (laughs) Yeah. But, but aside from that, it was, it was really just, uh, it was me and Igor and everybody else who's from Korea. And, um, you know, they, they, right. they kind of treated us like little, you know, like zoo animals, <laughs> you know, they'd be like, Oh, hi, good to see you. <laughs> uh, like, here's this little assignment. Now go and like, don't bother us too much. Just, you know, let the adults talk. And, um, right. yeah. So I, I'd say as a result, it wasn't too like foreign or friendly in that way. Um, but I was glad that Igor was mm-hmm. there because otherwise I wouldn't have had any friends at work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess you did that for something around two years that you worked there as well as, you know, two years in the master's program. 
So how did that lead to you moving to Romania following that experience in Korea? Yeah, so uh, actually while I was living there in Korea, I uh, happened to fall in love with a Romanian girl. And um, Mm. it was kind of a a long and uh, complicated story. But ultimately, like she and I met while we were both doing our master's. uh, And we kind of kept in touch. She had to leave. She eventually came back, blah, blah, blah. And um, yeah, we ultimately made the decision to get married just for papers originally because she had to keep leaving Korea and I was like, well, I'm here. Um, let's, let's do that. So you don't have to keep leaving all the time, but it's just for papers. That's it. Right. And, um, that was, I wish I had not done that, (laughs) but, um, Mm -hmm. we, yeah, so we did that. And then eventually when we decided to leave, uh, I was under the impression of like, you know what? I kind of want to just make it on my own. I want to either make a business or do freelancing. I don't want to work for the man anymore. Mm. Um, but we're going to be in financial free fall. And, oh, hey, things are way cheaper in yeah. Romania than they are in the U.S. Let's move to Romania. Oh, wait, what? Your parents are there and we can stay with them for free? Great. And so um, so we moved to Romania. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. And it was it was great. I don't know what else to say. Like, I, I loved living in Romania. Um, Let's see, we lived with her parents for about six months while I was trying to make it, you know, on my own. And I was, I was just completely unsuccessful. Like self-employment life is just not for me, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm just doomed forever right, to be right. a slave in the ant colony. But um, <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> we ended up moving to, to a small town in Transylvania, um, which also I feel a bit embarrassed to say this, but really... It shows how they don't teach us enough in school growing up in the U.S. I really thought that mm. Transylvania was just a fictional place growing up. Like I didn't know it was an actual real place. <laughs> I'm, I'm so, I feel so embarrassed right. admitting that. <laughs> but, you know, and, and then she's like, oh, I'm from Transylvania. I was like, ha ha. Yeah. Now you know better, so it's all good. At least, right? Yeah, at least I learned something. Yeah. I just insulted this woman who would later become my wife you know, when I first met her. Um, so we ended up moving there and lived with her parents for a while in uh, the village up there in Transylvania. And then later on, we moved to uh, a bigger city called Cluj, which is kind of like the, like kind of like the the main big city in northern Romania in Transylvania. Uh, yeah. And what was your daily life like there? I mean, obviously, you were trying to build a business. Uh, you were in this sort of relatively new marriage at the time, but what what was it like for you to try to integrate into that new society? Yeah. Um, moving, moving there and being with them, I think integrating to that society was so much easier because I, it was, it was just like moving to a new place with training wheels on. I mean, her, her parents were fantastic. I mean, they were, they really almost became like my best friends (laughs) while I was living there. Um, Hmm. and, uh, they didn't speak any English at all. So, um, Hmm. so pretty much, you know, when I started off, you know, they, like the, the second day I got there, you know, they would just point at random things. They were like, Bahar, Jam. And I was just like, mm. oh my God. Uh, all right. <laughs> I guess we're doing this. <laughs> but they were really patient. They right. were really nice. And it, yeah, I mean, over time, uh, I was able to at least have, you know, some, some grasp of the language. Um, I mean, I think when I was at my height, I was maybe C1 level Romanian. Um, oh, wow. But That's really great. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, it was sink or swim, right? But uh, luckily, they were really yeah. nice and patient with me. And so they kind of gave me an in to Romanian culture as a result. And um, I, yeah, even when we moved to the, the next place, you know, sh- my wife at the time already had her friends. So her friends became my friends and all that. This may be jumping the gun a bit, but after we got divorced, oh my God, spoilers, uh, mm. we got divorced later on. Uh, but even <laughs> after that, I found... I found that like with Romanian people, like it was just super easy to make friends with the Romanians. Like, whereas in Korea, mm-hmm. I didn't know a single foreigner who had like any Korean friend. I didn't know anybody who did, who had any Korean friends in Romania. Like, well, one, there wasn't too many foreigners, but like, I didn't know a single Romanian who did not have a foreign friend. Like they're mm-hmm. really welcoming, like really easygoing, chilled out. Also, I think like, yeah, they're not so used to foreigners being around, so they're much more like just open. And they're like, "Oh, wow, where are you from? Let's let's talk to you." And um, 
yeah, overall, like I think it, it's much more easy probably for someone from a Western background to to come into a place like Romania. When you were living there, did you have an opportunity to travel around the region and keep the travel going or were you more focused on your life there in Romania? Yeah, definitely. I would actually say that it was when I was living in Romania, that was when my my interest in traveling really started to bloom. So uh, my ex-wife, she was working as like a documentary filmmaker. So we would occasionally go to different places here and there. Uh, she would go to different like filmmaking workshops or on different projects. And so as a result, yeah, we did get to travel um, around, mostly around Europe. Um, but we got to go to a few other places. But <clears throat> I mean, honestly, traveling in Europe is just like so, so easy <laughs> compared to anywhere else that mm. I've been to. Yeah, yeah. You know. And so, like, if you go to Romania, it's, like, really easy to just, like, hop on a low-cost flight and go to, well, anywhere, you know. So, yeah, we we went to the UK, we went to Spain for a bit, um, went to France, Germany, Hungary. Um, yeah, just a bunch of different places. And I think it was at that point nice. that I was like, man, this whole EU thing is really nice. <laughs> like, it's really nice being able to just travel where you want yeah. to and work <laughs> where you want to. That's great. So, um yeah, I think that was that was a big starting point for me. So even though, unfortunately, that marriage didn't work out for you in the end, it sounds like you had a really great life that you built for yourself in Romania. So I'm curious how it ended up that you moved back to the U.S. shortly after that uh, experience. Yeah, well, alas, all good things must come to an end, right? Now, um, it was, I would say it was mostly me getting divorced that made me, well, I, at first I was like, you know what? I don't want to go back to the U.S. I really like it here. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to stay for a while. And so I did. And um, I mean, it was it was hard at first, you know, like I didn't really know a whole lot of people because all of, you know, my then ex-wife's friends, mm. for some reason, chose her over me. God. Right. <laughs> um, and um, but yeah, I stayed for a while, started to build another group of friends. But then it probably shows that I just make decisions like way too off the cuff without really thinking them through. But I, I went home for I went home for Christmas one time uh, and I, it was just really nice. It was really nice being back mm -hmm. around, you know, like my, my friends, you know, around my family, even just kind of little things like being able to overhear conversations of people nearby. Mm -hmm. Like th that was something that was never really something that I could do, you know, in, in foreign countries. And yeah, so I got this feeling. I was like, man, this is, this is kind of nice. Maybe I should move back. You know, it'd be, it's been at that point, it'd been like six years that I've been living abroad. And I, I was thinking, well, okay, maybe I should come back and make, you know, put down roots again, reconnect mm -hmm. with old friends, build this kind of like feeling of community, I guess, that I've been really longing for, uh, for a while then. And so I did. Um, it was a bit, it was a bit tough to say goodbye to everything there, but I guess I thought that I was, you know, moving towards something greater and uh reconnect <laughs> reconnecting right. with who i am yeah you know, so yeah <laughs> so you moved back to austin right i guess it was was there any particular reason behind that outside of the fact that we went to university there or was that where mm -hmm. most of your friends were i guess yeah so actually when i first came back i moved back to my hometown uh corpus christi mm -hmm. and um i stayed there for a bit uh maybe about six months or so uh but yeah well while i was there things were like, eh, not quite working out. We'll get to that in a second. But um, I, I just took a trip to Austin, you know, to visit old university friends. And um, while, yeah, while I was up there, I was just like, oh, man, you know, I got nostalgia feelings completely. And just like, oh, it was so great here. Oh, it was such a fun time in my life. Oh, Austin's such this like cool, quirky town. Wow. And uh, I was like, man, I, I should move here. Hmm. And also simultaneously, um, you know, kind of back home. I, I still have really, you know, wonderful friends back there. I, I love them, but I noticed that, well, a lot of them had stayed behind there in, in my hometown for the most part, and I had left, and I I had changed a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result of them, you know, not really changing, like they, they stayed more or less the same. Of course, they grew in their own way. But, you know, I, mm -hmm. I kind of found that there was this sort of disconnect. You know, there were mm -hmm. there were parts about, me like I wanted to talk about things like thoughts that I had about like oh man you know how what's like living in other cultures or like man mm -hmm. these people think this that's crazy and it just felt like 
my friends just had no interest in it. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so I started to feel this, like this vague disjunct between me and my friends. So I thought, you know what? Okay. I'll go back to Austin. It's bigger town, more fun. Also, I have old university friends up there. Maybe I should try that. So that's what led me to go yeah. to Austin yeah. uh, at first. And, and how was that for you? Like, did you find that it met your, I don't know, interest or desire in the ways that you wanted to connect with people and in your career? <laughs> oh, man, not at all. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I moved back there and it, it, it there's this like this old phrase that uh, they say, like, you can never go home. Mm. And oh, my God, man, it's true. Like, I, I moved back there you know, thinking that things were going to be just like they were in college and it's just going to be, right. you know, so much fun and I'm going to go to all these places and I'm going to learn so many things. And I realized like, that's just not possible because yeah. college, that, that entire experience served me while it did, because I was, I was a kid <laughs> when I moved there, you know, I, I was like, when I, when I moved there, it was, it was this feeling of like, Wow. Oh my God. You mean I can hang out with my friends every night and I can stay up past midnight yeah. <laughs> and watch, I can eat ice cream and watch movies on a Tuesday. Wow. And you know, like somehow when you're 28, 29, it just doesn't do it for you anymore. And right, so right. I realized that a lot of my feel, feelings of this, like, Oh, the halcyon days of, of university, they only felt that way because it was new and exciting back in the day. But when I moved back, yeah, there yeah. is. Well, well, for one, a lot of my university friends can't blame them for this at all. Like, I mean, I was gone for six years and they, they kind of moved on with their mm -hmm. lives. You know, yeah. they had their own friends and I was like, Hey, let's hang out. And they're like, mm, I'm busy. Sorry. And it, it was, it was tough. And I felt that, well, also um, in, in the intervening years, I lost my faith. And so a lot of my old mm -hmm. university friends were a Christian and I wasn't anymore. And mm -hmm. there was also this kind of just like disjoint and worldview that made it a lot more, mm -hmm. well, it made it, I don't know. I wanted to talk about things, deep things. And it was just kind of hard, you know, when mm -hmm. every conversation would be like, well, that's just what the Bible says. And I'm like, well, I don't want to talk about the Bible. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. About, you know. right. Right. Did, did you consider maybe moving to a different city in the United States to try that? Or, I mean, obviously we know, as we said at the beginning that you end up back in Prague or in Prague rather. Um, right. But was it, what, what was your thought process in terms of, okay, I've tried it back in my hometown. I've tried it here in Austin. What's next for me? Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. So at the time I was working remotely for a company in Columbus, Ohio, and there was a time, well, yeah. So as a result, I had to go there every couple of months and uh, I, you know, it was, it was a decent town. Like I kind of liked it. And there was a hot second where I was thinking, you know, well, maybe, maybe this would be nice. Maybe I, I should move up here. There's this weird feeling of guilt associated with that because I did still have these friends that I cared about back home, even though things were, mm. things had changed. And I somehow felt weird, like this idea of being like, hey, I'm here, guys. Uh, actually, I'm going to move to Ohio, but I'm still going to be in the country. This is weird. And so there was mm. that feeling. There was also this, this scary feeling of having to start over again. And there was also this creeping feeling of just like the, either I had changed or the U S had changed or something, but like just overall mm. the culture and everything was just not, it, it just didn't feel good. It, you know, at first I chalked it mm -hmm. up to reverse culture shock. I chalked it up to, I've been gone for a while. I just need to readjust. But after eight months, nine months, I still felt weird. Like thing, people did things and it just bothered me and pissed me off. Like, also, it was especially around the time that things really exploded with people becoming much more, you know, angry at each other politically for everything. And right. I, I was just like sick of <laughs> that. <laughs> and right. yeah, there were just a lot of things about American culture in general that I saw that I didn't like. And it made me start to think back to, to how things were in Europe and Romania. And I was like, man, people are just so much more so much more down to earth and so much more sane there than they are here. Like maybe I should go back to Europe. Yeah. Uh, so how did you make that move and how did you decide on Prague ultimately? Yeah. Um, the thing that really swayed my opinion was 
okay, well, past a certain point, I was like, yeah, I should, I want to move back to Europe. I'm not sure. Even though I do really miss Romania, it feels like maybe I'd be taking a step back because ultimately, isn't mm. that what I did when I came back to Texas? I just like, I went back to where I was, didn't work. Right. Maybe I should go somewhere else. And um, I was strongly considering going to Spain um, because the few times I'd been there, I really liked it. Um, mm. Wonderful weather, really friendly people, food's really great, you know, beautiful architecture, you know, insert reason here. Um, so there was that. Yeah. And, but also uh, my, my partner, uh, she was living in Prague. And so we were already long distance for a while. Mm. And I was like, well, we can still make it worth long distance. I don't know. But ultimately, weirdly, feelings just got involved. <laughs> and uh, I, I was like, yeah, it would be nice to move to Prague. Um, there was sort of this weird trial version thing where for a summer, I just decided to come and stay in Prague for two months and uh, just see how it would go, living separately from her. And while I was there, I was like, yeah, mm. this, this is nice. Um, I, th I think I could see myself mm. living here. And uh, so that was ultimately what, what, what clinched it, I guess, for me. Yeah, definitely. So how would you compare the life there to the one that you had in Romania, for example? Mm, yeah. Um, it's similar, but there, there are some, some differences. Um, I would say the, the infrastructure in the Czech Republic is, is a mm. lot better than it is in Romania. Um, yeah, well, for one, uh, at least where I was living in Romania, like up in the Northern part, there are almost no highways or interstates, you know, pretty much every road that you travel mm. on is just some like really not very well maintained <laughs> kind of like back road. <laughs> and so as a result, if you want to drive anywhere, like the fastest you can go really fastest, if you don't want to break your car is maybe 45, 50 miles an hour. And so mm -hmm. as a result, if you want to get around, it takes forever. <laughs> you know, you would, if you want to even just get out of Transylvania, it takes three hours or something. Whereas if you had an actual highway, it, oh, would, take, wow. it would take like an hour. Um, so there are things like that. I mean, the fact that there's, you know, it's much easier to get around. The train system is a lot more modern. Um, the, I noticed though that culturally it is, it is different in a way. Um, hmm. I noticed that whereas in Romania, people were, well, in Romania, like they're, they're very self-deprecating. <laughs> like they, they actually, one of the things hmm. that you like commonly hear, like if you get in a taxi talking to the guy, he'll be like, oh man, only in Romania would you see this, this crap or whatever. And I was surprised to see that, you know, but as a result of them being kind of self-deprecating, they're like, Ooh, foreigners, that's cool. Like let's, let's learn about you. Like I'm interested in this. Whereas in the Czech Republic, there's kind of more of this feeling of like, nah, like just sort of disdain for people who aren't mm. Czech. And I mean, yeah, mm. there's, there's also just like a lot of racism here compared to what you'd find in Romania. Um, and so that, that was also right. something to really, uh, you know, to deal with. Uh, yeah, I'd say those are kind of the main things. Anyway. Do you find that you like living in this city more or in the city that you were in in Romania overall? Yeah, it's really tough. I think overall, I preferred living in Romania. Um, hmm. That's not to say that I'm not happy here. I mean, actually, I am. I mean, okay, so there are a lot of different factors to consider, right? Prague, right. the great things that it has going for is it's beautiful. Like every time you go down, like downtown, you walk across the river, you feel like you're in a fairy tale. It's yeah, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's beautiful. Um, the public transport is fantastic. You know, you can get from one side of the city to another mm -hmm. through Metro or tram in 30 minutes. It's really not bad at all. And it's cheap, you know, in terms of transport. Yeah. Uh, also on top of that, like, yeah, the cost of living is not that bad except for rent. Rent is terrible in Prague, but, um, everything mm -hmm. else, you know, if you want to go out for a night of drinking with your buddies, it costs about, let's see, 500, it's about 20 us dollars. <laughs> it's not bad, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. the bad, the bad things though, is that, yeah, there's kind of more of this parochial, you know, uh, if, if it's not, if it's not Czech, then there's probably something wrong with it kind of mindset. Whereas in Romania, mm. you get people that are like really friendly towards outsiders. You would get, you know, but that would kind of come at the cost of, well, the, it's not as beautiful. Uh, public transport's not as great. Right. <laughs> you know? But plus, things are way cheaper. 
if you if you live that way. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's a lot of trade-offs, yeah. but I think overall for me, what's most important is having really good friends and having a good time with them. All the other stuff is nice to have, but it, it's still kind of secondary. But yeah. Right. So I'd like to talk a little bit about your your job. Uh, I know that originally yeah. you were working for this company remotely in Ohio, I believe, and then I think you've transitioned into working for a local company there in Czech Republic. So if you could just walk us through how you did that and your thought process, why you did it, that would be great. Yeah, it was ultimately all because of visas. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. it was, uh, yeah, I was working remotely for this company. Um, I was making, you know, an American salary, which was nice. I mean, I, yeah, I don't mind saying it. I mean, like after tax, it was probably about $4,200 a month or so. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was great. Uh, and especially for, you know, living in the Czech Republic, that's really good. Um, yeah. but there was this constant just weight on my shoulders of thinking, like, I just, I felt the hands of father time clicking down, you know, whenever it came for me, like, I'm going to have to leave soon because my visa is going to run out. Oh my God. And eventually it got to the point where I was, I was just like, you know what? Okay. I, it's probably best for me just to get a job here. If I'm planning on staying here for the long haul. Mm. Also working remotely is just really not for me. You know, people talk about, ooh, jet setter lifestyle. Mm. I mean, and that's cool if it does it for you. But like, for me, it's lonely, man. (laughs) Like, I really, Mm. oddly Mm. enough, like, I prefer to go to an office and be around coworkers that I like and to just chill out, laugh, talk, whatever, have a good time, grab a beer after work if you feel like it. Not if you're mandated by the company. And Yeah, (laughs) not if you're mandated, yeah. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. you better have fun. Um, So, yeah, as a result, I was like, well, I should probably just search for a job here. And I did, and uh, mm. I get all that at the current place I'm living at. Well, not right now because it's COVID, but I did back before this plague right. hit the world. So, right, right. No, that makes a lot of sense. I think, as you're saying, there's so many people that are trying to do the digital nomad jet letter jet setter lifestyle, and as a result, um, it does fit some people great, and other people it doesn't fit so great. And I think people should go for what they want and it's great to try everything basically sure. so give it a shot yeah. but um yeah. but if it doesn't work don't feel bad about it either you should go for what exactly you're best, right? and that was the hard part i think for a long time i thought what's wrong with me because mm-hmm. you know like i saw like you know the instagram style pictures and like oh working from the beach today hashtag remote yeah. life or whatever and i i was like yeah I'm, I'm doing this but i still feel just awful all the time like i you know there maybe i'm just not doing it right maybe, uh, and I, I couldn't actually accept that, yeah, it works for some people and it doesn't for others. And I, I just happen to be one of these people it doesn't work for. Yeah, 100%. So uh, what was it like to restart the language learning now so many times, right? You've, you've gone to all these different countries that all have their own language. And um, I mean, of course, yeah. you can get around, as you've said, in English in many situations. And yeah. um, other times you're forced to learn and maybe sometimes it's, it's more of an option. So how do you kind of think about that in terms of really diving in for a third time in a brand new language? Yeah, um, it's it's actually, it's been kind of useful in the sense because, yeah, having to learn Czech when I moved here, it was three years ago now, um, from having done it, having done it twice before in Korea and in Romania, it, you do kind of start to get an intuitive feel for what what are the important things to learn. You know, like what are what are the phrases that you use a lot or what are the sentence structures that you would commonly use versus not? And you just you learn those first because you'll get the most bang for Mm -hmm. your buck. And so I'd say as a result, it's made it's made language learning a lot faster and a lot more streamlined. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm still not an expert. I'm I think I'm probably like B1 in in Czech. I don't Mm -hmm. know if your listeners are familiar with like the European system of language. I don't know. Yeah, um, maybe, maybe if you could describe it a bit, like what does what does B1 mean? What can you do or what do you not feel comfortable doing yet? Yeah, um, let's see. So B1 means that you're like an independent learner. So like more or less you've learned the, the main grammatical rules of the language. Um, you know how to piece together sentences. You can more or less do all that. The main thing. And for the rest of your life, it's just going to be learning vocabulary and all these other words. And so as a result, at that point, you're like supposed to be 
at a level to where you can kind of learn on your own. Like you learn from interacting with people, mm -hmm. from having conversations with people in your target language. You do all this stuff. Um, again, because my listening is just awful, it's a lot harder. <laughs> I'd say maybe I'm B1 speaking <laughs> and probably A2 listening, which sucks. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, so at A1, A2, B1, B2, and then C1, C2 on top of that, right? Um, so right. even though my right. my production, my speaking, and my writing and reading is here, my listening is below that. So mm -hmm. it makes it belabored. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, if you're B1 level, you can you can theoretically like go to the post office and send a letter or package. You can set up a bank account. You can uh, potentially call like a customer service line if you have some issues with something. You know that kind of thing. Whereas the higher right. levels are like being able to have a political yeah. discussion or whatever. <laughs> yeah, uh, that sounds like a pretty good way to describe uh, where that is. And I'm curious, okay, you've gotten to, let's say, about B1 level. Um, but it sounded like, in general, maybe compared to the Romanians that you met, the, the um, Czech people are not quite as open to other foreigners as, as you might hope. So I'm curious yeah. how you developed your friend group and what that looks like now. Yeah, I've actually been really lucky with uh, how things have turned out for me here. Um, because when I talk to other foreigners here, most of them say it's kind of similar to what it was in Korea. They don't have any Czech friends. Um, mm -hmm. I was really lucky because, uh, yeah, where I work is actually, mm -hmm. they just kind of have this, this culture where people are really chilled out and friendly. And, you know, you go for beers after work or whatever. And as a result, I, yeah, I've made a few Czech friends. Also, <laughs> the funny secret of former Czechoslovakia is that, you know, there's the Czechs and the Slovaks and there's a lot of Slovaks living here. And they're basically like the more sociable, mm. cooler, like cousins of the Czechs. And there's a lot of Slovaks mm. where I work mm. and I'm actually like friends with more Slovaks than I am Czechs. And um, mm. yeah, so as a result, yeah, I, I, I've had pretty lucky just in the fact that, yeah, my coworkers are pretty cool. And that's how I've made most of my friends around here. I still have some other expat friends. Um, like great. there's this Dutch couple, me and my partner hang out with a lot. Um, another old friend of ours from who's from the UK, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, just to wrap us up here, do you have any general advice for people that want to try to live abroad or maybe specifically in some of the countries that we've talked about today? Yeah, um, I would say so. Uh, I, I found for me that whenever I moved to a new place, uh, whether that was in Korea or even moved back to the US or here, if you don't feel like you're making friends at first, like that's okay. <laughs> like mm -hmm. it's, it's yeah. really hard at first, but like I went to a place of, Oh no, there must be something wrong with me. Everything must be messed up. Maybe mm -hmm. I should leave. But I found that usually after about actually about six months to a year of living in a place, that's when things start to kind of click and you start to actually mm -hmm. make more deeper, closer friendships with people. Um, so the first six months, it's really hard. It's isolating. Just wait it out. <laughs> That's all you can do. And, you know, just do your best to, to make friends that way. Also, another thing too, that's, uh, been really helpful. I found is meetup.com. Uh, you know, where it's just like, for instance, Definitely. if you like, yeah, I mean, I don't know if your listeners are familiar with it, but yeah, I mean, if you like sushi, for instance, you can make a sushi group on meetup.com and you just make some event and be like, Hey, let's all go eat sushi next Thursday at this place. And whoever happens on the website can find it and they'll just show up and you immediately have stuff to talk about because you're both interested in sushi and you have like a springboard. You don't have to go through the awkwardness of like, Ooh, do I talk to, Ooh, I don't know. I don't know how to start a conversation because you're already there. Like they obviously are there to hang out too. And it's, it's a really great way to meet new people. I definitely use that in most actually, yeah. even when I'm just visiting a place for like a, a week or something, I'll still go to a meetup just to like, just to meet people and hang out and do stuff. So that's also a nice way to get to know people. Yeah. Now those are great piece of advice and I agree hundred percent. I'm a big meetup fan. And also I think it takes at least one year, honestly, to yeah. really get settled yeah. and have that core close group of friends. So it I really totally does. agree. And, and you, and you do start that investigation of yourself. Like, am I doing this wrong? And then I have to remind myself every time, no, it takes time. Like, yeah, I really, even at the stage I have to remind myself. So yeah, and when you're in it, yeah, yeah, and when you're in it too, it's just so much harder as well, right? Because it just feels like time stretches out indefinitely and whatever. But yeah, you just gotta right. stick with it. 
Yeah. So what does your plan look like for the next few years? Do, do you plan to still stay in Prague for the foreseeable future? Um, uh, probably not. <laughs> uh, let's see. I'm, I'm happy here now. Uh, things are pretty good. Uh, you know, we, my partner and I have like a good friend group and stuff. That's nice. Um, there's a lot of good things to like about Prague. Uh, I think ultimately in the long run though, we probably won't end up staying. My, my feeling is that I would still like to see a couple of other places and there is still kind of something about the Czech mindset that, that bothers me. So I've been talking, we, we've been talking about uh, where we're going to move. Uh, we might potentially be moving to the UK uh, in a couple of years because, well, my mm -hmm. partner's from there and she wants to explore some you know, career opportunities. Another possibility mm -hmm. is uh, the Netherlands because uh, you know, we're moving to these mm -hmm. like places that have terrible weather apparently. But um, yeah, supposedly <laughs> like with, <laughs> from what I've seen with the Netherlands, at least living there, you know, it's, it's great, beautiful place. Uh, also to me, it just mm -hmm. feels like this, you know, in terms of like the, the Dutch mindset, whenever I think about like the EU and everything I like about it, I kind of think of actually the Dutch mindset, the sort of cosmopolitan, mm -hmm. you know, easygoing, just, you know, like, cool. Yeah, you can do your thing. I'll do my thing. It's nice. So right. it might be one of those two. Uh, we're not too sure. Okay. Awesome. We'll definitely look forward to seeing where you end up and how things go for you there in Prague while you're still there. Definitely appreciate so much you coming on the show today and talking about your experiences, sharing about your time in Korea and Romania and the Czech Republic and even a bit back in the US. So look forward to keeping in touch and take care. Yeah, you too, man. Take care. If you enjoyed today's episode, please take a minute and give us a five-star review on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. It helps new listeners find us and lets us know that we are putting out content that you appreciate. You can quickly find out where and how to rate us at ratethispodcast.com slash expatempire. If you know anyone who would appreciate this podcast, please tell them about it so we can continue growing the global expat empire community. Keep up to date on new expat empire podcast episodes by pressing the subscribe button in the podcasting app of your choice. You can also visit expatempire.com and sign up for our newsletter to get our free ebook, Top 10 Tips for Moving Abroad, right now. We are also on Facebook and Instagram at Expat Empire, so be sure to follow us there. We are currently offering free consulting calls to discuss your moving plans and how Expat Empire can help you to achieve them. Please visit our website to schedule your call today. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for the next episode in the coming weeks.